Herzlich willkommen, Rochim Abaim. Meine Damen und Herren, liebe Freunde in diesem wunderschönen Gotteshaus. Mein Name ist Florian von Heinze und ich bin der Initiator des heutigen Abends. Sehr gerne. Den Botschafter des Staates Israel, seine Exzellenz, Ron Prosor, auf die Bühne bitten. Guten Abend. Seht ich äh, mit all diesen Lichtern sehr natürlich wie Madonna hier. Äh, Frau Sowetzki, Sie haben also wirklich mit Herz und Seele gesprochen. Und ich glaube, also ich werde die Sache ansprechen. Herzlichen Dank, Herr Botschafter. Und nun möchte ich unseren Stargast auf die Bühne bitten, den wundervollen, charmanten, bezaubernden, fantastischen William Goldstein. going to start the program with a composition I will create here dedicated to the hostages and those who lost their lives on October 7th.
Herzlichen Dank, lieber Bill. Was viele von uns wahrscheinlich nicht wissen, ähm, das sind Echtzeitkompositionen, obwohl ich glaube, du hast es vorhin erwähnt, Florian. Ähm, Bill spielt ähm, Musik, die in diesem Moment kommt. Er hat mir vorhin ähm, erzählt, im Grunde genommen ist es so, wie wenn man ähm, einen Satz sagt. Dieser Satz wird vorher nie so sein, wie man ihn sich vielleicht denkt und er wird hinterher nie so sein, ähm, er wird nie wieder so sein, wie er in dem Moment war, wo man ihn gehört hat. Und das sind äh, Real-Time Compositions. Um, Bill, could you explain how you create these real-time compositions? Could you tell us a little bit about it? Well, um, I guess the answer to the question, Andrea, and it's a great question, is uh, you have to ask yourself, how is it that any of us can express ourselves in real time in conversation to another person? When you're conversing, you don't have to organize the sentences or the words beforehand, you speak them in real time. So somehow, some way, I was blessed with the ability to speak the language of music in real time as easily as I can speak the spoken language. Now why that is scientifically, I cannot tell you, but basically that is what I've kind of come to understand over the years. So, and to demonstrate that, I very often have uh, people come over to the piano and uh, pick three notes on the keyboard, which is something I learned a few years ago, Franz Liszt used to do, and then create a piece from the three notes to illustrate that actually it's really happening in real time. I mean, the piece I, I did a moment ago, um, evolved during the uh, performance and composition of it. But you might think, oh, well, he really walked in with it. But you'll see now that whatever happens, just happens. Yeah. So, Andrea, please. Ja. Yeah. Er wird jetzt dieses drei Noten, ein drei Noten Stück äh, spielen. Ich werde jetzt äh, drei ähm, Tasten anschlagen. Ja. Yeah. I always ask that Whoever is going to pick the three notes, picks three notes that resonate with them. And if you really like the piece that comes out, you have to thank her. And if you don't like it, you can blame her. <laughs> okay, I will give my best. Um, okay. Um. Good. But, but, by the way, Avi, if you're out there, uh, a copy of the program was promised to me, so I'd know what's happening. Maybe you can have that delivered after this piece. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Bill. It was wonderful. I think the notes were okay. <laughs> My three notes, what I felt. So um, I think I, I could recognize the, um, I, I could recognize you. I could recognize your feelings, your thoughts. I think it was a mirror of us. Well, that's supposed to be my next piece, <laughs> a, a reflection on being here this evening. So I'm gonna try to do that in a, a different way. And I still need a program. So, okay, so, yes, so, yeah, what, what were uh, you going to, um, to uh, play next? Uh, I'm going to create something just based upon the honor of being here, the thrill of being here, the gravitas of the situation, and uh, knowledge that no matter what I do, I don't know how much of a difference it will make, but we all try to do the best we can to express ourselves and hope that something positive comes from that expression. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Bill. Er war lange Jahre erster Konzertmeister der Berliner Philharmoniker und wird William jetzt auf der Violine begleiten bei der nächsten Improvisation. Begrüßen Sie mit mir unseren wundervollen Gast Guy Braunstein. an improvisation. <laughs> Listen, uh, I, I think everybody has to know that what's about to happen now is really unusual. I didn't even think it was possible until 2012 when a friend of mine said, let's try to create something together. And I said, it's not possible. It's possible. Guy has never done this before. We did get together the other day, which was only yesterday, wasn't it? Something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And And it's, it, it, it's wonderful when it happens, but there are very few classically trained musicians who are that comfortable doing it, and it's an honor to be here with Guy. And what's going to happen, nobody knows, but I think you'll enjoy it. <laughs> Bye. 
That was wonderful. Thank you very much. Another one? Together? Together. You want to? You want to join us? No, we'll do another one. <laughs> All right. So, uh, yeah, it just magic happens. Now, what you've heard, no one in the world has ever heard before, and no one in the world will ever hear again, unless you look at the video, which I assume was beautifully prepared and a real keepsake. And we'll try a little something change of pace.
Oh ja, wundervoll. Ich habe ihm jetzt den Plan gegeben, damit wir wissen, wie es weitergeht. Der war irgendwie verloren gegangen. Aber so now you are you are going to play the, oh. this one. Ja. Okay, very good. One more. It's called Invention Romantique. It is not an instant composition. It evolved over years. And it is on my album, The Bach Effect, which is filled with music influenced by a fellow named Bach. <laughs> which you will hear. I, I must thank Florian von Hense for organizing this event and inviting me to come here. If it wasn't for Florian, I wouldn't be here. And Birgit, of course. And we'll see you later. Thank you very much, Bill. Thank you. Wir machen jetzt eine 15-minütige Pause.
und sehen uns gleich wieder. Dankeschön. Willkommen zurück, liebe Freunde. Als nächstes haben wir einen ganz besonderen Gast. Klalit Kizoni kommt aus dem Kibbutz Kfar Asa und sie war Augenzeugin bei dem Massaker am 7. Oktober. Und Lalit ist jetzt hier, um uns ähm, das zu erzählen, was sie miterleben musste. Sie macht das, weil sie Angst hat, dass der 7. Oktober vergessen wird. Und äh, das darf nicht sein. Lalit, would you come? So, hello everyone, and thank you for the invitation to speak here this evening. I stand here in front of you, and I can't believe it's been over three months since I found myself lying under the bed in the safe room, Mamad in Hebrew, for 13 hours, surrounded by the sounds of war and mass killing. In the past two years, I have lived in Kibbutz Kfar Aza, about a kilometer and a half from the Gaza Street border. On the morning of October 7th, at 6.28 a.m., unusual rocket attack began. Within 10 minutes, other, other sounds were heard. Sounds completely different from what I'm used to hearing during rocket attacks. Gunfire, explosions, and bombings messages started circulating in the kibbutz's WhatsApp groups, indicating a clear infiltration by terrorists. As minutes passed, the messages intensified, providing more detailed horrific descriptions. I went under the bed in the mamad, where I spent the following hours until the rescue finally arrived. I didn't grasp the magnitude of the events in, the real, in real time didn't watch the news, and most of the time, there was no reception. I knew that the incursion was not only in Tukfar Aza, as my parents wrote that there had been an inf 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 infiltration into their kibbutz as well. However, I chose to focus on personal survival and not to know too much. In retrospect, this was the most important decision I made in those hours, helping me preserve myself and my sanity. The terrorist attempted to enter my apartment several times. The apartment door was locked, and they didn't insist. In the building next door, they blew up all the doors. The neighborhood of the young generation, Don Sahir in Hebrew, is right below my building, about 20 meters away. There, a massacre took place. I heard everything, but couldn't do anything except hide under the bed and wait for the army to arrive. The army did not arrive. The power went out already in the morning, so I had no electricity, and around 4 p.m., my phone's battery died. I had nothing to do but wait and hope for the best. I was evacuated by the army at 7 p.m. in complete darkness, among the first to be evacuated from Faraza. I waited another five hours in the arms gathering area at the gas station outside the kibbutz. It took until after midnight to leave the area. And even then, out of more than 800 kibbutz residents, there were only about 50 of us evacuated with one bus. Most survivors were evacuated from Faraza only in the middle of the night and on the following day. The fighting in the kibbutz lasted for three days. 63 people were killed in Kfar Aza, and 18 were abducted. Some were released, and some were accidentally killed by the so-called friendly fire in Gaza. Five are still in Hamas captivity. I can't believe that over 106 days have passed, with more than 130 hostages still in immediate danger in the hands of Hamas, many of whom 
I personally know. I was born and raised in Kibbutz Nirin, in, western, in the Western Negev, two kilometers from the border with Gaza, where my parents still live, but now they are refugees in their own country. It's hard to explain to people who did not grow up in a kibbutz the strong bond among kibbutz members, the sense of family, belonging, and shared destiny. It's difficult to explain to those who didn't study in a regional kibbutz school the connection between different kibbutzim, the profound and intimate acquaintance, and the sense of family and belonging also to this extended community. Five people were killed in kibbutz Nirim, and another five were abducted two of whom are neighbors of my parents. Hamas terrorists tried to enter my parents' house, attempted to open the door, and when realized it was locked, they didn't insist, but went to the next door, abducting Hannah and Nadav Popovel. My father saw them from the window. Hannah was released, but Nadav is still there, in captivity, and Yagev Bokshda as well. Mir Oz, the neighboring kibbutz was like my second home during my childhood. On October 7, Nir Oz was like a black hole. No one came there to help the residents and the emergency squad. A group of residents trained to help in moments of crisis until the army's arrival. After the kibbutz emergency squad was killed, there was no battle going on in Nir Oz. When the army arrived late afternoon, there were no more terrorists to kill. They had completed their war and returned to Gaza. They abducted 77 people and slaughtered another 40, including Johnny Simantov, a friend of mine, his wife, and their three sweet children. Among the dead was also Said Moshe, the father of a close friend of mine. His mother was abducted and released after 49 days. Tamir Adal, that you saw his face earlier appear, a classmate, was a part of the emergency squad. He went to fight the terrorist on October 7th and disappeared. Two weeks ago, we received the news that he was murdered, probably on the same day, and his body is in Hamas captivity. A quarter of Nir Oz community was abducted or killed, an incomprehensible disaster. In Kibbutz Be'eri, my beloved high school teacher, Rotten Calderon, was murdered. Also killed were the parents, brothers and sisters, uncles and cousins of good friends from high school. Friends from the same school year. Three more classmates were abducted, Adi and Tal Shoah, with their children. Adi and the children were since then released, but Tal is still in captivity and we have not heard anything about him since he was abducted to Gaza in a car truck. Another classmate, Itai Svilsky, was abducted alive, filmed by Hamas alive, and a few days ago, in a disgraceful video, we learned that he was murdered in Hamas activity. I could continue and list more murdered and abducted people that I know, but I will spare you of that. What's important for me to clarify is that this is a tremendous trauma, shattered communities, endless grief, and a broken heart that breaks again and again and again with every news of another murder, of someone abducted alive and now dead. For us, the event of Hamas attack has not ended. We are still within the event, within the trauma, and we will not be able to begin the healing until all hostages return. They won't be a victory image for us. We have already lost too much, more than we can bear. The most important thing to fight for now is to bring all the hostages back home. They are in immediate danger. Bring them home now. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you very, very much, Lalit. Yeah, this. Thank you to share this horrible story. Never forget. So, William. So maybe you could um, show William three notes so he could uh, play another piece. Sometimes I like to say, when there are no words, you can express yourself in music. And there's some things that you can't really express in any language, but I'm going to endeavor to uh, create something respectful and uh, responsive to what we all just heard. So, Dali, pick three notes that resonate with you, darling. Try a couple of combinations and see what happens. Thank you very much. There really are, are no words or anything. Uh, I, don't, I don't know what to say here. Are we doing the dance next? Or? The next, yeah. The dance is next. OK, so while we're. I think it's with, uh, with Guy. Oh, uh, no, we're not. OK, we're not. Uh, yeah. Yeah, right. Just, with Guy. Yeah, just the chair. OK. Guy, please come up. All right. So. Uh, <laughs> Uh, we're going to have a change of mood here. This is a hard act to follow uh, because Talit was the reason we were all here, I suppose. Come on up, Ty. Uh, but we're going to change the mood. 
change it up, as they say. So we're going to do uh, the French Suite. Do you have the French Suite here? Yeah. Okay. Uh, the French Suite is a piece that I wrote 20 years ago and recorded on my first solo piano album called First Impressions. It's a three-movement suite, too long to do on a program like this. So I have created a medley of the three movements, which actually works kind of nicely. And um, it actually starts with what is the second movement called Hommage to Amour. And then it goes into the third movement, which is now the second movement, called Cycles. And it finishes with the first movement, very confusing, called A Paris Thing.
Thank you so much. Pardon me? The dancer is next. Yeah, the dancer is next. <laughs> we have to move the piano away. Um, yeah. Jetzt kommt nämlich noch ein ganz besonderer Gast. Sie ist ähm, Tänzerin beim X-Ballett äh, Schwerin, Mecklenburgisches Staatstheater, Hanna Korostelova. Und Hanna ist heute eingesprungen, weil ähm, also ursprünglich sollte Alexander heute Abend hier äh, improvisiert tanzen gemeinsam mit William, aber Alexander hat sich leider verletzt und Hanna ist zum Glück eingesprungen, sodass wir diesen Teil unseres Abends jetzt doch noch für Sie zeigen können. Sadly, I uh, nichts verstand sie Deutsch, so uh, but Anna, I'm just meeting for the first time. She's never done this before. I've never done it with her. We had no rehearsal. She, as, as Andrea just, but it's going to be beautiful, as you'll see. <laughs> Whatever it is, it's going to be beautiful. I'm sure. <laughs> Anna.
Well, that was magical. Thank you. Guy, let's... Let's add uh, Herr Braunstein to the mix and uh, see what happens. Thank you. 
Thank you very much. So, oh yeah, they have to uh, put the piano back. So, Bill, what are you going to, to play next? Well, I think, well, what is next? I what think you it's, uh, oh, yes. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Wow. Okay. <laughs> this will be the only piece, uh, well, not the only piece, actually, but this is a piece I did not write. I do very little repertoire. Um, it's easier for me just to create in real time than to learn a piece. But there's one piece that is so moving for me and um, just seems to have the heart and the empathy for so many of the problems in the world and it is still positive and it's uh, my interpretation of the Rachmaninoff vocalese, which is pretty much the way Rachmaninoff may have originally done it before it got committed to paper.
Thank you so much. Pardon? But I'm a big fan of Rachmaninoff's. <laughs> William is übrigens ein mehrfach für den Grammy und Emmy nominierter Komponist. Er hat äh, unter anderem die Musik äh, zu Fame geschrieben und er war viele Jahre lang bei Motown Records. 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 Stevie Wonder, Diana Ross. It's a very good question. But I am thrilled that in 1975, Barry Gordy, who founded Motown Records and discovered all those people, thought there was something special about what I do and signed me as an artist on the Motown label. And fast forward, in 2009, Motown Records released the best of William Goldstein on Motown, which is 85 minutes of stuff I did as an artist, as a producer for people like Smokey Robinson and whatnot. And what I'm going to share with you now, I was asked to perform at a Motown concert in, uh, it was a year ago, October, so I guess it was October of 2022. And um, they said to me, you know, you know, your biggest record, Midnight Rhapsody, is not really a household name. So we'd like you to go into the Motown catalog and pick something that you can do your own version of. So I, I picked a wonderful song that Diana Ross had in the 70s, written by Michael Masser and Jerry Goffin, called Do You Know Where You're Going To? And I picked it because it lends itself tremendously to a Baroque interpretation. So I really own this piece now, and it was released a year ago, and just about two weeks ago, it, it, it uh, is a classical release, it's over a million streams, and it's just going and going and going. And I'm, this is the first time I've ever played it for an audience because the Motown concert that I was supposed to appear at uh, I came down with COVID, coronavirus, one day before the concert. So my name was on the program, but I wasn't. But here we go.
Wonderful. Next. <laughs> What's next? A prayer. Well, I need Guy back here. Okay, let me tell you about a prayer. So, uh, what I just played, my, this recording, do you know where you're going to? It was over a million streams. I'm going to play you uh, the fourth movement from a four-movement suite called Remembering Mariupol which was written a week after Russia invaded Ukraine. And it is over, it's close to 1.5 million streams. And it's been on playlists for Amazon and Apple consistently since it was released, which is like amazing as a classical artist. And I must say, I had a lot of fun as a Motown artist, but I'm having more fun now. Uh, and this piece, um, it's a prayer. It's a prayer for what we all hope we will achieve at some point uh, for humanity. It's very simple, and it's and inspired by anybody who really is into uh, music. It's inspired by Handel. Uh, I almost lifted it, but then I changed it enough so I, I'm not embarrassed to share it with you. Thank you so much. Thank you. 
Wir kommen jetzt zum Ende dieses wundervollen Abends. Und wir hatten noch eine Idee, nämlich am Schluss Hatikwa zu spielen. Eternal Hope. Eternal Hope. Eternal Hope. Okay, well, I'll, I'll, it's on mine. All right, so this is, um, I call it Eternal Hope. It's inspired by Hatikva, which you will absolutely recognize. It's very short, and after we do that, I'm going to ask Guy to come out, and if you like, we can actually sing Hatikva. But this is uh, a sort of mini con piano concerto version, and here it is. Thank you. Thank you. Wenn, es wäre schön, wenn, wenn Sie alle mitsingen würden. Hatikwa auf Seite 8, finden Sie das hier, ähm, die israelische Nationalhymne. Bitte schön.
my trusty mic holder. Thank you. It's really great to be here. And for now, up we the same. If you ask me, I will come back. Yeah.